This podcast is sponsored by A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London and Middlesex, both family owned and operated. By Hyde Park Care Pharmacy. Experience the difference an independent pharmacy can make for you and your loved ones. Hyde Park Care Pharmacy offers personalized care, short wait time, very competitive pricing, easy transfer of your prescription, and much more. And by Molly Maid. During these times of COVID-19, it has never been more important to keep your family safe. With the healthy home cleaning system, Molly Maid London is here to help. Make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Maid London today. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever and wherever you may be tuned in. We welcome you to another edition of the Vickers Crossing podcast. The Vickers Crossing is a virtual space where faith intersects with the public square. And my name is Rob Henderson from Holy Trinity St. Stephen's Anglican Church in London. Kevin George here from St. Aidan's Anglican Church, also in London, Ontario. My name is Ian and wrapping it up in London also. <laughs> He's the producer of this fine affair. Yes, producer Ian in the house, and have oh, we got a yeah. pod? Have we got a podcast for you today, folks? This is going to be good. I've been looking forward to uh, chatting with our guest um, coming up in just a few minutes, uh, who is Ingrid Waldron, professor, author, producer, and she will be joining us in the Zoom room coming up in just a little bit. And last night, um, both Ian and I were just talking this before we started our our recording that we uh, watched um, the Netflix documentary that her book was uh, kind of inspirational in, in putting together. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about that and, and much, much more with her. There is something in the water. Is on it? Netflix. Oh, on there Netflix. is something yeah. in the water. That's what it's called. There's something in the water. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and cheers. This, this, is, <laughs> this is an important one for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is very much so. I want to say hi to our uh, sponsors today. As always, our good friends at A. Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London and Middlesex, both family-owned and operated. And our thanks again to Dave Mullen and his staff for their support in our podcast. You know, when I think of that, Rob, I think of Seth Meyers, uh, you know, Late Night with Seth Meyers. Mm -hmm. He Why? has this, because he has this segment called You Burnt. And I wonder when, when Dave does a cremation, does he finish with, you burnt? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so, uh, probably not. I don't know. Anyway, that's, that's not nice. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I, I want to give a shout out to uh, Carol Basada. Carol Basada owns Hyde Park Care Pharmacy, which is locally owned, locally operated, locally loved, has all your pharmaceutical needs. It's right here in the neighborhood. It's not a big, giant, big box, multi-billionaire outfit. Go support local business. Drop in and see Carol at Hyde Park Care Pharmacy today. Yeah, I need to go get my eye drops from, from there because I, I placed an order. Yeah, I do. Haven't done that yet, but yeah. I see. <laughs> we also want to say a special thanks to Molly Maid. Make your home a healthy haven. Call Molly Maid London today. Mm. Many thanks to Trisha Lister for that one also. Right. Have, they, have they fumigated your room yet? Yeah. Uh, that's this week. That's oh, that's this, this week. week. I keep hearing Good. about this, but it hasn't right. happened. We should rec record the fumigation as it happens. <laughs> and listen, don't get your eye drops from Molly Maid, okay? I won't oh, get no, my eye drops no, from no, Molly Maid. No, that's, no, a no, different, that. that's a different thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do really appreciate all our sponsors and thank them for their support. It's been really helpful to, to get our podcast off the ground and to, uh, to bring it to new heights. So things have been going really well, and we're appreciative of that. All right, uh, let's play Sickness or Suds, guys. Here we go. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right, let's do it. What do you got? So sickness or suds, I am going to give you a word or a phrase. Yeah. And you're going to tell me if this is a sickness <laughs> or, or, or a sud or, or a type of beer. Ah, I see. So, mm -hmm. so a sickness like what the president of the United States has. Yes. Topical. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or, well, he has many sicknesses, to be fair. I did tweet, <laughs> I did tweet the other night to Walter Reed asking if they had a psych ward. Oh, very good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, well, he's so got the special. He's got the special COVID though. It's the COVID you only get for two days. Yeah, a couple days. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then it goes away. Okay, so we got to pick if this is going to be something yeah. like that, or if it's a refreshing cold sudsy beverage. Yes. Right. Right. So okay. our word today is campy. Ooh, campy. Campy. Thought that campy. would perk Ian's ears up. Ooh, being a camp guy. Campy. 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 Is campy a sickness or a sud? 
are we allowed to ask is how it's spelled? Like, is it spelled yes. like we think? Uh, C A M P Y. Campy. Oh, campy. Are you sure it's not an adjective? Um, well, I don't know. I didn't get my, I didn't get my dictionary. I didn't check it out. <laughs> Rob, you've been studying Merriam-Webster this morning? <laughs> Campy. My spare time, yeah. Campy. Campy. Kevin, is it a sickness or a sud? I feel like Campy is a sud today. I feel you like it's, a, I feel like it's a, beer? a beer that you get when you put on your plaid shirt and you sit mm. around a campfire, you get yourself Campy. Okay. Um, Ian? I think I agree with Kevin on this one. I, I was leading towards Sud when I first heard the word. Um, so I'm going to stick with that. But uh, yeah. Okay. Two, <laughs> two, two Suds today. Two suds. For, the, for the first time, I got you both. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> both. We're both wrong. Now, to, you know, to be honest, I cheated a little bit because okay. Campy is kind of the short form okay. of the actual sickness. Mm -hmm. um, the long form uh, is Campy uh, Lobacter, Campy Lobacter, yeah. which actually is a bacteria that your dog or cat may get and pass along to you. Uh -oh. So that's why they get the shots. See, so right. they don't get they don't get the Campy Lobacter. See, right. and pass See, it you, along to everybody in the house. This is tricky. See, he knows this because he was blessing animals on Sunday at the Feast of St. Francis. <laughs> he was virtually blessing animals. So I'm going to guess somebody brought you a pet. <laughs> this campy Lobach or whatever the frig is Nobody called. had the campy. No, no pets had. They were all very, they were all inoculated like, as far as I know. Okay. All um, right. So there you go. That's sickness for studs today. Wow. Nice. Good. Yes, yeah, and uh, Okay, ready for part two of the fun and frivolity? Part yes. two. Time now for... For Ask Ian Anything. Ask Ian Anything, Kevin. Yes. We, All right, Ian, you have, to, today? you have to pick. You have to pick. You have oh. to pick one of two things here. This okay. Question, this question comes all the way from Strathroy. Oh, okay. of course. Strathroy. This is uh, coming from our friend Rick in Strathroy. Mm -hmm. So Rick in Strathroy wants to know, you get to pick one, okay? okay. One. Spring uh -huh. or fall? Ooh. Oh, that's tough. That's really tough. Because mm. um, like my birthday's in the spring kind of time. But I also really like when the leaves change colors to fall. Um, you can only pick one. Mm. Um, I'm going to pick fall because... Um, I like when the leaves change color and also follows when like you start to get like your, your, your fancy sort of candles out and everything starts to get cozy again. And you're all like, like I put a bl another blanket on my bed. Cause I like, I like being cozy when I'm asleep and all that stuff. Um, and like busting out the tea and all of that. Yeah. That's why. Busting out the you're tea. So, he's busting out the <laughs> Earl Grey. <laughs> I, I, like I get out my orange pico and I put on a nice cozy blanket and enjoy the fall. <laughs> busting no, out good, the man. tea. Busting yeah. out the tea. That's a new one. You got to write that one, bro. <laughs> quack, quack. Quack, quack. Um, okay. What about I you, think, Robbie? Spring I'm or gonna, fall, gonna Robbie? I'm a note here. Fall. Uh, I pick, um, I'll pick fall. Okay. Mm -hmm. I love the fall. I love the cooler air. Yeah. Um, I got a little, I got a little Scottish blood. So I think it's kind of, you know, passed down <laughs> through generations. I like the damp, cold, foggy days <laughs> where you can get the, you can break out the tea and, yeah. uh, break and, it and out the tea, bust out the tea, put on a big warm bust sweat. out the tea, man, bust out the tea. I, I, here's, no, the fall. Thing with I this, love fall. Yeah. here's the thing with this question. I feel like if you ask me in the winter, I would say spring, you know, cause yeah. you're just like, man, seasonal fuck, affective cold. disorder sends in. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. What about you, Kevin? Spring or fall? It's a tough one, uh, but I do like busting out the tea. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I thought Rob was going to say when he said he has some Scottish blood. I thought he was going to say he has some scotch. I was going to say I do have some scotch, and yeah, I find I have that scotch cool in my blood. Yeah, 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 and the cooler evenings are nice to have a nice scotch. There so I do. I, I think the three of us might agree on fall. I do mm. think, as much as I look forward to new life in the spring, yeah, something about this. Mm -hmm. uh, season that reminds us really of the cycle of it all in this part of the world. Anyway, I'm not sure how it feels if you live in say Ecuador. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Spring, summer, fall, winter. I mean, what time yeah. of year is it? What I don't know. It? So it's the same one all year. 
All right. So we're all in agreement on that one. Good. Yes. Good. Yes. So we're going to invite uh, Ingrid into the Zoom room here in just a couple of seconds. I think she's ready to join us. But before we do that, um, just want to plug something, Kevin. We've got a special Vickers Crossing event coming up. Um, I don't want to say tonight because we're recording this the day before, but um, Wednesday. Yes. Right? By the so time you, you listen to it, it it'll time, be tonight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or it will have happened after you bless you, before you bless you. <laughs> if you're listening to this depending November, on when you're listening <laughs> it's all over man time is weird wednesday october 7th rob yes okay is the first um canadians praying for americans on the vickers yep. crossing yep so tell us a bit about that so it's a yeah sort of a um opportunity for people we've all been concerned about what we see in america we keep thinking there's a bottom but there is no bottom i mean uh, the events, we're recording this on Tuesday. Yesterday, there was a perfectly Chairman Mao scene at the White House where the president flew in, saluted a helicopter, did a photo op, took off a mask. He's, vir he's virulent with COVID. Um, it's just all madness. And what we're learning as we talk to our friends in, in the United States is just how stressful this is for all of them. I mean, we joke and make light of it in a way, but but it's deeply serious for them. There are elections coming up on the 3rd of November and everybody's worried, not just for who's going to get elected, but what's going to happen <laughs> after the election because of the yeah. way things, I mean, it's all this sort yeah. of, um, uh, you know, questioning the ballots and the stuff that the current administration is doing, which is really causing a lot of stress. So we're going to come together for four Wednesdays, beginning uh, Wednesday, October 7th, each Wednesday night, 9.30 p.m., for an event called Canadians Praying for Americans. Uh, be in touch with us, and we'll send you the Zoom link to join us. Uh, we have people joining us from Victoria, British Columbia, all the way to St. John's, Newfoundland. Over 100 of you have registered so far. We have uh, Pastor Angela K. Bob joining us tomorrow uh, um, on the 7th, um, uh, who was a previous guest on here from Minneapolis. We have Pastor Carl Day from Philadelphia, who some of you will remember from um, the ABC Town Hall questioning President Trump about why, when was America great for, for black people. Diana Butler Bass, oh my gosh, how can you get better than Diana Butler Bass? Yeah. She's gonna be with us the uh, 28th, um, uh, the 21st, sorry. And uh, on the 28th, we have an upcoming guest, Brian Zahn, uh, whose writings are just incredible. And he's pretty alive on Twitter right now too with his concern about the election. And then the night before the election, on a Monday night, the November 2nd, we have Karen Gonzalez, who many of you will remember, wrote a book called uh, The God Who Sees. She's in Baltimore. She's right next to the epicenter of all this in, in uh, Maryland, uh, right next to DC. She's going to join us for that last night. Uh, and we have beautiful music coming now. We've got Mark Smith and Sonia Gustafson. Ian, uh, do you know this guy, uh, Ian Stevenson? We have a guy named him. Ian Stevenson. Heard of Steven him, yeah. Ian Stevenson singing as well. Yep. Young, young woman from Newfoundland called Lauren Han, beautiful voice, happens to be my great niece. She too is singing. That's wonderful. And Ian might be debuting his new tune, Breaking Out the Tea. Breaking no. Out the Tea. No. Well, what was it? Is it Breaking Out the Tea? No. Busting Out the Tea. <laughs> Busting out, <laughs> out, out the Tea. Busting Out the Tea. I didn't know. I, it's going to be a rap. I, I feel like yeah, it's going to be a rap. So. I think so. So, no, that's great, Kevin. I'm so thrilled to be able to do this. Oh. And uh, if people want to register, if, if, if yep. it's past the seventh, but there's still Wednesdays coming up and they Absolutely. want to be part of it, how do they do that? Anytime along the way, just email us at Canadians praying for the digit, the number four, Canadians praying for Americans at mail.com. Canadians praying for, like the number, like however you meant yeah. it, for, four. Canadians praying for Americans at mail.com. All right, good. Um, all right, so our guest is here, I believe. She's been I believe she's waiting. here. Let's so get her let's, in. Uh, let's uh, just take a quick break. We're going to bring Ingrid Waldron into the Vickers Crossing right now. And our guest has arrived here on the Vickers Crossing. We are so thrilled to, to welcome to our podcast today, uh, professor, author, producer, Ingrid Waldron. And uh, Ingrid, thank you so much for, for taking the time just to spend with us today. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. And joining us from one of the most beautiful parts of the country, are you in Halifax? Is that where you're? Yes, I'm right. Live? Uh, Central Halifax. Oh, beautiful. Perfect. All right. Good, good, good. So we, uh, we're thrilled you're here, and I know we have lots of questions to talk about and uh, lots of things to, to share. Um, so, Kevin, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you good, buddy. Okay, <laughs> yeah, sorry. So I had a little pause there. Um, yeah. We're going to get Kevin to give you a little bit of a, an introduction to our, to our listeners, if you would. 
Great. Yep. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're glad to have uh, Ingrid with us today. Dr. Uh, Ingrid Waldron is an associate professor, a professor in the Faculty of Health at Dalhousie University. And you, she is the director of Environmental Noxiousness, Racial Inequalities, and Community Health Project, also known as ENRICH. Her research, teaching, and community leadership and advocacy work in Nova Scotia are examining and addressing the health mental impact, mental health impacts of structural inequalities within health and mental health care, child welfare, the environment in, in Indigenous, Black, immigrant, and refugee communities. As the director of Enrich Project over the last eight years, Dr. Waldron has been investigating the socioeconomic, political, and health effects of environmental racism in Mi'kmaq and African Nova Scotian communities. The Enrich Project formed the basis of her first book, There's Something in the Water, Environmental Racism in Indigenous and Black Communities. The Netflix documentary, There's Something in the Water, is based on her book and was co-produced by Waldron, actress Ellen Page, Ian Daniel, and Julia Sanderson, and co-directed by Page and Daniel. And uh, if that wasn't impressive enough, now you're a guest on the Vickers Crossing. I guess you're going to have to put that in your bio. <laughs> We're glad you're here. Welcome, Ingrid. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Uh, you're, you have, you, you've now arrived that you've spent time on us, let me tell you. This is it, yeah. This is it now. You can die happy now. So, <laughs> so anyway, look, let's get into some of the conversation here. But we thought we'd start with COVID. Now, I realize uh, you and I had, had, had a, a little email exchange. There's probably not a lot of data yet as far as all this goes, but we do know sort of anecdotally, and I think we are beginning to see some findings out of this part of the country anyway, um, that this, while it's been a hard year for many people in Canada and around the world, here in Ontario, uh, right now even, the second wave seems to be coming back. We're up to seven, 800 cases a day again. It's fair to say that minority communities, though, have been harder hit by this than most. Um, at Dalhousie's open forum on COVID in April, you, you said this, the disproportionate location of African Nova Scotians in low-income essential service jobs, as well as the legacy, of racism, sexism, classism, colonialism, and intergenerational income insecurity and poverty in their community means that they will be more exposed to the social detriments that put them at risk for the virus. Intergenerational income security and poverty also mean that African Nova Scotians are more likely to live in households with large, multi-generational families, making it less likely for them to isolate or quarantine sick family members in separate bedrooms or use separate bathrooms. That was April. Lots has happened. Uh, we know a little bit more now, as we are seeing, like I said, anecdotally, and certainly probably there's been some research here in Ontario, I believe you've mentioned. What are we learning? Like, uh, how, how bad has it been? Um, what we're seeing is something similar to what uh, we saw in the United States back in March or April, when, they, when the studies indicated that uh, low-income uh, communities, particularly African-Americans and Latinos and Hispanics were um, more exposed or more likely to be at risk for COVID because of the factors that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. When those reports were coming out, I remember there was a major um, report outlined in the New York Times. Of course, there were fears or concerns here uh, in the Black community that a similar thing might happen because um, they also are disproportionately low income here um, mm -hmm. and poor. Uh, they tend to live in multi-generational households. They typically are essential service workers who have to go out to work. They don't have the privilege of staying home and working. Um, and they have to take transportation. So we were seeing similar things here in terms of the profile of African Nova Scotian communities. Um, we don't have the data as yet. I am currently conducting a brand new study on COVID uh, with a team and we are in the first stages of it. So we don't yet know what, of course, of course, what the results will be, but a lot of information has come out in the, in Toronto and mm -hmm. Montreal uh, indicating definitely that uh, black Canadian communities and other racialized communities are disproportionately impacted by COVID for those same reasons. So, if you are black and you are racialized um, in North America, um, there are certain things that you share. Low income, poverty, large households, um, insecure jobs, uh, low income jobs, 
not having the privilege of working from home, use of transportation, sometimes in terms of the United States and in, in Toronto as well, living in densely populated areas where it's very hard uh, to physically distance. Uh, so all those things are true for racialized communities and black communities. So it wasn't that surprising, the findings coming out of Toronto and Montreal. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, I mean, like one of the things that we noticed here, I, I suspect it was probably the same out there, was at the early stages of this, there was a lot of um, adulation and, and, and uh, sort of praise for all those essential workers. Um, you know, here in Ontario, there were large corporations like, uh, like the Loblaws uh, chain, uh, the, the Galen Westons of the world that added $2 an hour to people's wages. Um, and then, uh, and then swiftly a couple months ago, raked all that back because somehow or another now it's, it's okay to go back to a, a wage, which is less than, than sustainable really. Um, I just wonder if we've lost, I mean, I, I felt like in our own community here in the church community, for instance, there was a lot of concern about a living wage, for instance, or a universal basic income. Our bishops called for that across the country, uh, because of, of what COVID exposed, um, I wonder if we've lost some of the momentum or some of the steam. I just, it seems like there was a real hunger to change things, but the more complacent or COVID tired we've become, it seems like those things aren't on the front burner anymore. Am I, am I off on that? I agree. I think we've gotten accustomed to kind of a new normal mm. and the kind of furor uh, that happened uh, in March. Yeah, that's abated a bit. Um, I think what it, what it shows us, it shows us that, yeah, we need to, we need to take seriously or we need to appreciate more um, employees who are doing that type of work. But I think it goes even beyond that. I think we have to recognize that there has been longstanding structural inequities mm -hmm. in labor and employment and that within labor and employment, uh, our jobs are segregated based on race and gender where we have ghettos, what we call job ghettos. Yeah. And those job ghettos are, you know, who's disproportionately located in those job ghettos. It's racialized mm -hmm. people who are also gendered in specific ways. So racialized women and immigrant mm -hmm. women, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So it speaks to the need for our government to address some of the structural inequities mm -hmm. facing communities that are low paid, that are often in ununionized jobs, um, that are disproportionately in temporary, casual, insecure jobs. There's a kind of broader conversation that needed to be had that we really haven't had. Yeah. So it's not enough to say, yeah, we appreciate them. Look what this has exposed. It indicates to us that we need to take care of them without, yeah. without touching on how those inequities are structurally embedded right. and, and the need to look at the issue using a much more intersectional lens, because yeah. if we're talking about who's most exposed to COVID, then adding gender to the mix when we talk about race, yeah. oftentimes it means that racialized women will be disproportionately impacted in specific ways because of the types of jobs that they're located in vis-a-vis -vis mm -hmm. racialized men. So we never seem to have deep conversations about yeah, all of these things in Canada. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it stays at a particular place, never allowing us to get deep. Very, poli right. very polite of us in Canada to talk about, <laughs> to talk about yeah. racism on this superficial level. Yeah. How, dare, how dare we talk structurally and systemically? That's right. Uh, right, you know, I mean, but ultimately that's where it's got to go. I, I just think about, I come from Newfoundland, as you know, and Oh, yes. uh, back in the day, when I left Newfoundland back in the 90s after my first uh, university experience and, and moved to Ontario, there were, you know, immigration was pretty low in the Newfoundland in those days. And so we didn't see people who looked, uh, we being uh, whitey here, uh, didn't see people that were any different. Um, but when I travel back to Newfoundland, well, before COVID, when I travel back to Newfoundland, and I go into in St. John's now, it's a, it's a much more diverse community. But where do you see the diversity? You see it in these low paying service jobs. It's, it's the, the people who've immigrated to Newfoundland from the world over have landed, and largely women, have landed in these jobs that we couldn't, 
you know, we couldn't think of finding when we were university students because Newfoundland was in such a state. But now that things have moved ahead, here we are. And, and again, systemically, what are we doing? We're bringing people from around the world who have more gifts than how to serve a coffee. Um, and, and, and I worry that we, we're not yet getting to that systemic uh, conversation. Anyway, Rob's, Rob, Rob's going to shift us. Sorry, I got on a rant, Rob. I got on a rant, Rob. <laughs> Off he goes. Um, <laughs> but all good, all good. No, that's the thing, you know, we're talking about, one of the themes that's come up on our podcast, Ingrid, over the last months of this COVID thing has been the, the veil that's been lifted. And you pointed to that just now um, in and around inequity and these types of things. In, in those marginalized communities and black communities. But the other thing is, and Kevin mentioned, is the systemic racism that's kind of, the veil's been lifted on that in a big way as well, especially with the murder of George Floyd. Um, that really set that off in a big way. So I wanted to ask you a bit about um, your, your wonderful work. There's something in the water, environmental racism in indigenous and black communities and, and systemic racism. When we hear that phrase and you know, it's been talked about in policing recently and, and education and healthcare. Um, but we don't often think of systemic racism um, connected to environment uh, as an environmental racism. And that was kind of a new term for me too when I started to read a little about yourself and your work and then watching the Netflix uh, documentary, which we'll talk about too. So could you just for our audience uh, talk about what you mean by environmental racism, which you describe as kind of another manifestation of of settler colonialism? Well, like you in 2012, when I started the project, I had never heard of that term. Mm. Uh, that term uh, was introduced to me by an environmental activist who asked me to take on the project because he was leaving to go to Oakland uh, to start up um, an initiative. So when he mentioned to me that there were cases of environmental racism in Nova Scotia, I thought to myself initially, how could the environment be racist? Mm -hmm. Like I was hesitant to take on the project because it just seemed out of this world. And even though I agreed to take on the project maybe a few days later, um, I continued to be very doubtful about what this all meant and about its existence. But as I continued to do more readings and you know look at the literature on the topic i realized that it was about systemic racism within environmental policy mm. right so environmental racism sounds like a very catchy term and i also have received you know letters from people who say dr waldron can you please explain to me how the environment <laughs> could be racist, it's this racist. is really ridiculous. Yeah. You know, I got, there were letters like, I, was, I did a newspaper, I was featured in a newspaper article in the Chronicle Herald, and you know when they used to allow people to comment, that was one of the comments. Yeah. But as I continued to read, I said to myself, it's about the systemic uh, racism within the policies and decisions that are made by environmental professionals, for example, in the Department of the Environment. So when, what we see on the ground is a spatial patterning of industry in certain communities, black communities and indigenous communities. There's a clustering of pulp and paper mills, incinerators and landfills in those communities, but they don't get there without policy, without what is often called an environmental assessment, depending on which province you're in. It's an environmental assessment that um, is used to make the decision about where, for example, a landfill is placed. Mm -hmm. or a pipeline. And a pipeline seems to always end up in an Indigenous community. So the decision, the information that goes into that environmental assessment comes from somebody who made that decision, right? You've got mm -hmm. to point back to the people who are working in the Department of Environment, for example, who are writing policies, who are writing environmental assessments, and have made a decision about where that pipeline or landfill mm -hmm. should go. So that's the systemic nature of environmental racism. On the ground, visibly, what we see is a clustering of waste sites in specific communities, but it's an outcome of policy. Right. Uh, why is it systemic? Because in many ways, racist ideologies get written into policies, not just with respect to the environment, but with respect to every social institution in Canada and North America. It's how biases, mm. uh, normative assumptions about people, and I guess just to be honest, racist ideologies about people get so written into and embedded in policies that sometimes 
it seems kind of, it is invisible, mm -hmm. right? So when you see a landfill in particular communities over and over again, you don't immediately think that's racism because it happens institutionally right. and it happens covertly right. and right. subtly. And right. that is the way that systemic racism operates within all of our social structures. That's why it's very difficult for white people, but also uh, you know racialized people as well, to say, I'm not seeing it. You, know, you mm -hmm. don't have to prove it to me. Uh, I don't see the racism here. And they want stats and they want facts. And because it's very difficult to detect the subtleties of racism, particularly when it happens institutionally. But the example that I just gave you is an example of how that happens because the people in power mm. are typically white people. Mm -hmm. And depending on the institution, it typically is a white man. That white man is not necessarily doing anything that is, he wants to purposely harm a community, but he's writing policy and he's engaged in action that reflects his worldview that reflects his lived experience. He's not familiar with other people's lived experience. We all wake up every morning, all of us, with a particular experience. And sometimes it's difficult to, for us to understand or empathize um, with other people's experiences because we don't live in their bodies. So as a white man, all you can do is understand your experience if you're, for example, not educating yourself or perhaps you don't have friendships outside of your racial group yep. and you are coming from that place. So while it may not always be from a malevolent place yeah. or a purposeful place, the impacts uh, are racist and the yeah. outcomes are racist. And, and we so make it, this, it's yeah. about people coming from a normative worldview. Right. That's their worldview based on their status as race, as white, as male, as as straight, as yeah. able body, and we yeah. all act in that way. And what yeah. we do in our professional lives is a reflection of that. And we make decisions naturally that will benefit us and take care of us. The us being, you know, the white males around the board table creating the policy. And again, like you say, it's it's not about thinking it might harm someone outside of that. It's about this works for everybody, and we all say yes. Yes. And and until that again, that veil. I go back to the idea of the veil being left, and we start to see that. Um, we, we, we won't recognize it. Yeah, yes. That's a great point. One it of also the, comes out of a, a fear. You know, we, we, fear, we, yeah. we're worried about losing. Mm -hmm. We're worried about other people gaining. Right. So we are protecting our group yeah. because there's a fear that we will lose something yeah. while somebody else gains. If yeah. we allow indigenous, if we, if we don't allow pipelines and in indigenous communities, then where is it going to go as one mm -hmm young white female student said to me as she stood up during one of my uh, events <laughs> and she said, Dr. Waldron, if you are suggesting that the landfill in the black community in Lincolnville shouldn't be there, what are you saying, Dr. Waldron? Are you suggesting that they put it in our community, Dr. Waldron? And that was a, <laughs> yeah. it was a great, it was a great, yes. um, great teachable uh, moment <laughs> statement that she said, I was a bit shocked and taken back because there was 500 people in the room, but I thought yeah. that's basically yeah. what white people think. It's like, there you go. where are you going to put it then? Not yeah, in my exactly. backyard. That's the that's the NIMBY the NIMBY rule. Yeah, that's, not in my backyard. I'll yeah. tell you if you if you had to tell half the people who are carping about pipelines that we want to run them through Calgary or Toronto or you know any of the major cities, uh, they'd have a different tune about pipelines than the one that yes. they're singing. I tell you that. Mm -hmm. One of the I, actually one of the images just listening to you answer that question of Rob's. One of the images that ca that came up from the film is is where Ellen Page is narrating and there's that map of Nova Scotia with the with the minority communities and then all of the industrial uh, places. I mean, it's, it's quite remarkable. Um, and I think that one of the most blatant examples, examples of it, which I was totally unaware of uh, in terms of, of our willingness, and again, listen to the language, our, as if, but the, the, the willingness as a people, as a, a, co a colonial people to take over and destroy something is Africaville, uh, pardon me, Africville, uh, which I was unaware of. Um, and I'm guessing that a lot of people who listen to this podcast are as well. I just wonder if you can tell their story so that people are, are aware of, you know, we, we have this idea that somehow in Canada, racism doesn't touch us. But this to me is just one of the most incredibly heartbreaking examples of how ignorant we really are. Uh, that's, um, the Africa Bill is an interesting case of both environmental racism and gentrification mm -hmm. or urban renewal. 
So this was in the 1960s when the city of Halifax wanted to rezone Africville. They wanted the community out of there because they wanted to, uh, they wanted to build new businesses and um, in, they wanted industry in there and they needed the community to be out. That was a thriving, it was a thriving community and members of that community owned their own shops and businesses. I mean, they weren't wealthy by, by any means, they were low income, but a healthy, thriving, connected community. And in the late, 19, uh, the late 1960s, Africville was raised, meaning the community was forced out, they were expropriated, their church was actually burnt down, wow. <laughs> right? Because there was this urgent, yeah, yeah that, because I think a lot of people know that what the church symbolizes yeah. in, a, in a black community. Black oh, people yeah. are extremely religious. And African Nova Scotians, since I've been here, I recognize they're extremely religious. Mm -hmm. So the symbolism of that, right? So the mm -hmm. church was burned down and they were forced out. And many of them moved to um, an area where there is currently a lot of social housing mm -hmm. um, to the north end of Halifax, which is actually undergoing gentrification as well. Mm -hmm. So it was an example of urban renewal and gentrification, but what the bulldozing left in its wake were a number of environmental hazards. Mm. Uh, a prison, uh, railway tracks, an open dump, a cotton factory, et cetera, et cetera. So it became an environmental hazard. So I always like to use Africville as a great example of both gentrification and environmental racism, but also the white supremacist use of space. Hmm. Because gentrification to me is a spatial issue and environmental racism is a spatial issue. It's this, this notion that certain communities don't belong and that there are boundaries around specific communities and that the spaces that they live in always belong to white people. It never belongs uh, to black people in Canada or, or in the United States. So it's a, it's what I often call spatial violence. I see right. gentrification as violent because you're forcing out longstanding residents of a particular area who are low income and they don't know where to go. Environmental racism is environmental violence mm -hmm. uh, because you're doing the same. You're putting polluting industries in their communities, but those polluting industries also cause harm in terms of health right in terms of illness and disease so yeah. both are exact africville is a perfect example of spatial violence in several ways and to be clear to people i mean africville was uh, it wasn't like the community popped up 20 years before they raised it right i mean it, it has a history the people there have it, a history that's right so you probably already know that african nova scotians are the oldest black population in canada unlike toronto and montreal it's not an immigrant population. It, you know, they're very proud and they will always say, I am eighth generation African Nova Scotian. They've been in Nova Scotia for 300 years, making mm -hmm. them the oldest black population in Canada. So they're, and also a very rural population. There are 53 historic African Nova Scotian communities across the province. And they're primarily, I would say 99% of them in rural remote areas, unlike in Toronto and Montreal, where you'll find black people yeah. in the center, right? In the center right. of Toronto. So that kind of remoteness, the rurality that they experience also has other barriers, of course, because in general, we don't appreciate rural communities, right? They're under-resourced. Right. Yes. Um, so in addition to race and in addition to environmental issues, they have the issue of rurality as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ian, over to the producer. Yeah, so I watched the uh, the next Netflix film. It's what is it? There's something in the water, or yes, there yeah, is something in the water. in the water. I just wanted to get that right, and it's incredible. It's we were talking about it before the podcast, and it, it was just it's 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 eye opening. That's caused them to tweet at one a.m. Yeah, oh, I tweeted wow. at one a.m. Yeah, I was just I was like, holy cow, um, and it was it was in, an incredible story about on, uh, honesty and like vulnerability from from everyone in in the in the film and. One of the things that really stands out is Louise from Shelburne. Yes. Um, she told the story for the, for the listeners. She told the story about how her neighborhood was touched due to the fact of a, of a landfill and caused the neighborhood cancer. Now in my neighborhood, I know maybe one person who has passed away from cancer, but Louise drove down the street and was like, yeah, this person passed away from cancer and they, now they, they're 
daughter has cancer and this person is dead from cancer and there are two like ev- almost every house and it was it was it was like really sad honestly it was just awful and and that's not strictly only subject to to nova scotia is is there can you provide some other examples of anything that's happening elsewhere in canada cuz like if that's happening in nova scotia like i i couldn't imagine what's happening elsewhere in in canada and you're talking also about the high cancer rate right yeah. yes um right in your back door sarnia ontario we have amgen wong first nation mm an indigenous community that is surrounded by around 62 oil refineries that has incredible rates of reproductive illness, extremely high rates of cancer and respiratory illness. They're, I I, I forgot this statistics, but they're the ratio in terms of births, gender, yeah. Male to female ratio of births is out of whack. I, I have the information wow. in my book. I don't remember it right now, but no. it's abnormal. Yeah. Mm. Um, that is a community to me. That's just atrocious, right? right? Yeah. Sixty-two industries surrounding that community, and they've been, you know, mobilizing around that for decades, and yeah. not much has happened. So oh, that's yeah. a. That's a mm-hmm. I was just going to say, I wonder how many people here, like, Rob. I wonder how many of our parishioners. Uh, you know, in our two parishes, even know that an hour down the road. Well, I was going to say, I lived in Sarnia. Uh-huh. I lived for five, my, my, my mother was from there in the Strathroy area, uh-huh. in Sarnia. And I lived there for five or six years when I was younger. Now, be it I was a kid, but I don't ever remember conversations about um, in, even indigenous people living in Sarnia, let alone, um, you know, some of, some of this uh-huh. kind of stuff. Everybody knew, of course, from the oil uh, factories and, and stuff in Sarnia, but it's just when I hear that, it just you know my gut churns because uh-huh. I was in the middle of it, never even heard about it. You know that's understandable. I hear from so many people who say, "Oh, I'm a white person. I can't believe I didn't know this was going on." I, yeah. you know, there was a uh, there was an article that was recently written by somebody who's from Nova Scotia. She's now in Ontario, and she said, I've watched Ingrid's film, and I just, so I'm so angry with myself because yeah. I'm from Nova Scotia, and I didn't know this was happening. So I think it's understandable because these are communities that are typically not mentioned uh, in the media. Mm-hmm. Um, but environmental racism as a topic, I think, gets ignored a lot. So you combine those two things, environmental yeah. racism, indigenous people, you're probably not hearing about it. I think it's only in the mm-hmm. past few years we're starting to pay attention to climate change, and environmental issues, and I think young people are responsible for that. But I, I didn't learn about Indigenous people when I was a child. No. Um, no I didn't learn about any of this. I didn't learn about environmental racism during my PhD work. Right, right. Yeah. So this has been a revelation for me as well, you know, over the past eight years. It is systemic, too. I mean, I think that, you know, through through settler lenses, us white descendants, we look at the smokestacks in Sarnia and we see jobs, you know, like that's oh, yeah. the lens that we're looking at and, and it's all wrong. I mean, we need our, 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 our perspective changed, mm-hmm. but that's, you know, you can't talk about it without somebody screaming at you about jobs. And, and, you know, you, you, you find yourself asking at what cost, like, I mean, right. is it, wh- whose life is it okay to sacrifice? And that gets to the point of this environmental racism right. because it's, you know, we're, we're picking where we put this stuff. Because the, the um, conversations I was having around dinner tables at friends' homes were in, in friends' homes whose parents were uh, employees and CEOs and, and, and high ups in Shell and, and all yeah. those. And, and so we were sitting around these in these big houses, all us white folk, talking about how fortunate <laughs> we were, right? Yeah. My yeah. God, thank God for oil. Because, yeah. uh, yeah. you know, oh, I got a cottage and a boat yeah. and, a, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Three cars. Yeah, it's just mind blowing. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Somebody sure. down river is dying with cancer, but hey. But, you know, yeah, Um, you know, it's it's really um, it's really quite incredible when you when you think about it. And I I just know for us, I mean, our our stick here uh, is around faith in the public square. And so for us, one of the things that the Anglican Church is really trying to seize nowadays is this respect for God's creation and how we tend to that or steward that, that it's not ours to pollute. It's not ours to destroy. It's God's creation. And then what are we doing to, and we built it into our baptismal covenant now, what are we doing to 
to respect, sustain, and renew the face of the earth. And we've got work to do. And, uh, you know, your, your work testifies to that. So to shift gears a little bit, just to sort of bring the lens out a little bit in terms of racism in general in the country, which uh, I know you've, you have a good um, uh, sense of that as well. Um, racism is a problem that we think, as white settler people think, exists elsewhere. We're very happy to look down our nose at what's happening in America. Um, more and more, though, we're coming to see that we've got our own issues. Um, thanks be to God uh, for the Black Lives Matter movement and, and the many demonstrations that have happened across the world, around the world, in, in, since George Floyd's murder. I, want, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about racism here in Canada and how you've experienced it. Um, you teach in a school of nursing. Uh, I realize you're probably not teaching like how to put an IV in or whatever, but, uh, but, but nonetheless, you do teach in the school of nursing. Um, I wonder if you can give us your reaction to the death of uh, Joyce Echkawan. Um For our listeners who are unaware of the story, Joyce was a mother of seven. Uh, a First Nation community, uh, which I'll butcher the pronunciation of, but uh, at a Camus of Manawan in Quebec. She died on September 28th, a little over a week ago. Uh, she was seeking treatment for stomach pain in the hospital in Joliet. She posted a live stream Facebook um, post from the hospital, which is gut-wrenching to listen to. She's in pain. She's moaning. She's calling for help. The hospital staff can be heard in French calling her a fucking idiot and saying she's only good for sex. Uh, You've made bad choices, my dear, says one nurse. What would your children think to see you like this? You know, and again, what it speaks to the nature of how systemically racist this culture is and what I've been raised in that I can't even fathom this. Like, I can't fathom how this would happen because it probably, it wouldn't happen to someone in my family. It just would not happen because of white privilege. And that is hard for me to accept, but I need to accept that this is a problem. Um, It points out my white privilege. I just wonder if you can share with us your thoughts of that case, your thoughts on racism, how you've experienced racism. What, you know, where are we at? Well, that case highlights for me how uh, stereotypes and myths about Indigenous people and the way that they are perceived uh, gets embedded within the healthcare system. So the sexualization of Indigenous women is a longstanding myth or perception. Uh, The perception of her as an object because their words and their actions kind of relayed that they saw her as an object to be treated in that particular way. Um, their, her treatment showed me that they felt that she had little value and little worth. This is how Indigenous, Black, and other racialized people are seen uh, through that white gaze that we talk about. That's the white gaze. When right. white people look at us, this is who they see. People who are lacking in value, people who are lacking in humanity, I should say that, um, and people who have no worth. And that that type of treatment happens all the time. I think she happened to report it, but you know there are people here in Nova Scotia who talk about that type of treatment in emergency rooms and um, in different aspects of the health care system. It scares me because I I think at least one of those individuals was a nurse. Mm -hmm. And it tells us that we're not even protected in the hospital from Mm -hmm. people who are hired to serve us in when we're most vulnerable, right? Mm -hmm. That's scary to me. What I don't want is the conversation to stop at, which often happens in Canada, at kind of individual direct forms of racism. There's a Mm. lot of shock. Oh, look what happened to her. Look what they said to her. I wanted to extend beyond that because extend beyond that to structural inequities within our healthcare system that allows that to happen. Right now, Premier Premier, sorry, Premier Legault uh, said the person was fired. There's no systemic racism. He's been saying that. Yeah, he's been saying that to the media all summer. Yeah. Mm. Um, 
it to me it's um outcome of structural inequities within the healthcare system and we need to have once again a broader conversation because we like to stop there in canada we love to talk about the direct forms of racism one-on-one -on -one racism there's no racism in Canada, but of course there are bad apples. So mm. uh, those the staff members and the nurse were just bad apples mm. instead of seeing them as a product of a larger problem and that's right. structural inequities right. within the healthcare system that allows that to happen. And that means that the healthcare system is not representative in Canada, that the healthcare workers, the health professionals do not represent the broader society. It means that the policies, health policies are not addressing diversity cultural competency or structural competency, as I like to say, yeah. uh, within the healthcare system. Um, so I, I would like the conversation to extend more broadly to entrenched inequality within the healthcare system. Um, but also, you know, these are communities that always sadly anticipate mm. that these things are gonna happen. And perhaps that's one of the reasons why she was taping it as well. I mean, there's expectations from black people and indigenous people that these things will happen. And that's why they tend to underutilize health services. Mm -hmm. And of course that then compromises their health and well-being because if you're not going in to see your doctor frequently because you don't like the experience you had once and you're never going back, right. then of course it worsens the health issues that you already have. Mm. Uh, the health system is also not conducting outreach to these communities right. where they are, where they're at, right? There's an expectation yeah. that they go to them instead of, the healthcare system outreaching to these communities, that's, that's also problematic. Yeah. So extending the discussion to structural issues to me is paramount. And I don't think I've seen that discussion yet. Mm. It's just everybody's staying on the horror of what's happened. Of course, it's horrible. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's speak about the broader issues. Right. Um, in our last few moments together, um, I was hoping we could just talk a little bit about kind of the what now, like how do we how do we move forward? We've had so much information coming in our short 45 minutes together here with you, Ingrid, but like where do we go from here? We've seen protests, we've seen demonstrations over these last months for sure. Um, we've seen uh, uh, statues being taken down and uh, thrown in water and, and that sort of thing. I wanted to mention something coming out of uh, Nova Scotia. Um, the Regional Council adopted the African Nova Scotian Road to Economic Prosperity Action Plan. Um, which is a kind of a blueprint for socioeconomic development with and for Black Nova Scotians. The plan includes uh, building unity and capacity among, amongst uh, ANS communities, establishing land ownership, addressing environmental racism in the region, investing in the development of ANS communities, uh, increasing entrepreneurship opportunities as well. Um, and in supporting the plan, one of the councillors, Thomas Bernard, said this, that being an ally means taking stock and taking action and maybe even taking a gamble. Being an ally means taking the lead from community and working with community and amplifying voices from those communities. Um, so as we've said today, in a lot of different ways, being aware is important. We need to do that, but being aware is not the end point. It's got to be more. So how do we as communities, as a country, become anti-racist? So how do we move forward here? Okay, so what I, you know, what I witnessed, I, we all witnessed this summer with George Floyd and BLM movement. And it was, it was certainly a stunning sight to see. We haven't seen anything like it before. I, you know, I witnessed uh, on television BLM in South Korea. They were marching. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. never happened all before. Over. So. Yeah. I am not going to undermine the importance of civil disobedience, protests, marches, BLM, et cetera. But as others have said, and I, I believe that demands from the streets um, must be translated into policy. It's not enough to be in the streets. Um, the demands you're making from the streets need to be translated into policy. So, you know, even when I think about environmental racism, I'm still holding out for an environmental racism legislation. I yeah. tried to put that forward with a politician here since 2015, and that hasn't happened as yet. I don't think it's the full answer, but I think it's a piece of the puzzle. So I think in all issues with respect to racism within all of our institutions, you need to have strong policies and legislation. You also need to have people who are champions, because without, and I would say white people, because they're mm -hmm. the ones in positions of power, um, 
if they're not real champions, they're not authentically committed to the issues, then the legislation means nothing. And it's possible to find white people who are not just allies, but champions around an issue, mm. people in power. So I think that's important. So I kind of found my champion with Lenore Zan, who's an MP mm. and who created the environmental racism bill. You know, we have a good relationship and I know that I can kind of count on her. So she's my champion. Um, I also think that our future leaders are children, yes. your children, teenagers, uh, people in high school um, and in middle school. I think we need to start teaching children in high school and middle school and universities about environmental racism. I think all of you said that you never really learned about indigenous people. Yeah. I didn't. Yeah didn't know about Africville. I didn't when I was yeah. younger. So when we think about the fact that those are future leaders, they're the ones who are going to be in positions of power to address climate change, environmental racism, and all of these other structural inequities, we need to provide them with the right lens um, and the right critical tools and intellectual tools to understand these issues. So the educational system in Canada is not serving uh, students or children in the right way because they're not learning about these issues. And if they are, they're not learning about it in the kind of deep way that we've discussed today, right? In terms of the structural inequities and how it's an outcome of historical inequities. So I think mm. that's another issue. Um, I also think that what's hurting us in Canada is that we're not doing what the United States has done for decades. We're not collecting data. Mm. Black communities in Canada have been calling on the government to collect disaggregated data by race for years. Mm -hmm. And why do I think the government hasn't done it? Well, they don't <laughs> want to know because if you yeah. know, then yeah. you got to do something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> More <laughs> systemic racism. It doesn't, yeah, well, it doesn't suit. Um, it doesn't suit us, the white guy, you know. <laughs> why is it that we were talking about COVID and very comfortably saying it's hitting the elders more disproportionately? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. why can't we say that about race? Right. right? Yeah. Why can't we? Yeah. So they, were much, they were very comfortable collecting disaggregated data based on age. Yes. But then when you bring race into the mix, <laughs> yeah, well, we no. can't know that because then black people are gonna want us to do something and we don't wanna do anything. So I think within all our systems, we know that education, criminal justice, every single social structure, we are not as a federal government, perhaps provincially that's happening. That's how come I know that in Toronto, there are higher cases of COVID among black communities in, in Toronto because it's been done on that level, but on the federal level, that has never been done. We cannot address any issue. We cannot address inequities if we don't know what's happening. Right. If we don't know who's affected more by a particular issue, we cannot address it. So that's right. really key. Um, and I think we, we lack representation in our institutions. So I'm just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm building on what uh, Senator Bernard Thomas said, mm -hmm. that there's lack of representation. There's sometimes an unwillingness to work with communities. There mm -hmm. are black communities, you know, we've had a lot of reports come out in, in Nova Scotia and Toronto, and it seems like the government seems to want to keep going back to the drawing board. We need another report. Yeah. Another we study. Need another yeah. we committee. Need study. Yeah. And we're saying we've done that, and now yeah. it's time to act. Uh, I, I think sometimes too that there's an unwillingness to bring in um, black organizations, black representatives, black people who have been working on these issues for years, um, but particularly grassroots organizations. Yeah. You know, there are the traditional black organizations, for example, in Toronto and in yes. uh, in Halifax, but the grassroots organizations led by black people who are actually doing really great work on the ground and who have the ear of their communities they're often left out of the mix. So I think we need in every single social institution hiring policies that bring in uh, diverse voices. Um, right. Once again, as I said earlier, you know, you have your own lens, right? You've got a white male, yeah. gay or heterosexual lens. No, that's yeah. not a problem. That's not, that's, that doesn't make you a bad person, right. but you have a particular life experience. Yeah. And if you're making policies, you're only coming from that experience. So that's why yeah. we need different voices in the mix. Yeah. We need a Louise. We yes. need a Louise. Yeah, a Louise. Yes. Yeah. And a Michelle. And you need to support you know? people like Louise. That's because right. Louise is a grassroots yeah. leader, yeah. not working with much money, but we need to support people like her. 
Yeah. Is the church active out there in this, in this environmental racism? Do you hear from the faith community? No. Um, I have found it to be very challenging. Sadly. To engage black organizations in the topic, because I think with the black organizations specifically, they see policing as urgent, and I don't, don't disagree. Right. But there's this kind of um, hierarchy that I think happens in Nova Scotia where people feel that, well, we're dealing with policing, so we can't deal with environmental racism and climate change right now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? So right now it's for, for, I think, for African Nova Scotians, and I don't argue with it, but you know, policing is seen as urgent. Employment, of course, I don't disagree with that, and education. And I feel personally that environmental racism and climate change have been put to the wayside, um, Especially unfortunately. With especially with COVID now. I mean, I think it's yeah. pushed even further away. Yeah. yeah, but you know what? Studies are coming out that show that there's a connection between environmental racism and COVID. This should not be a surprise. That those right. communities that are suffering from respiratory illness because they're close to a waste dump are yeah. more likely to be impacted by COVID in terms of mortality rates, higher mortality mm -hmm. rates, because mm -hmm. they're already dealing with compromised immune systems. Yeah. There's a connection between yeah, COVID and environmental sense. racism. Yep, and there it is. There it is. Yeah. Wow. Well, Ingrid, look, uh, our time is coming to an end. We can't thank you enough for spending it with us this last hour. It's been more than educational. It's been moving. Um, and I know that our listeners will will uh, take away a lot from our conversation today. So thank you for sharing with us. We really do appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. It was great. Yeah. All right. And we do want to commend the, uh, the documentary to everybody on Netflix. There's something in the water. Please watch that. Um, you know, when we get back together and the church can gather again, this is going to be a must um, watch when I get my folks back together to sit in a room and have conversations about this. And um, so we're going to look forward to that. We also want to uh, just uh, say before we go, a quick thank you to all of our sponsors here at the Vickers Crossing, to Abe Miller George Funeral Home, where each life is celebrated, and their sister company, Cremation London Middlesex, both family owned and operated, to Hyde Park Care Pharmacy. Say hi to Carol and everybody out at Hyde Park. Appreciate your support. And to Trisha and the gang at Molly Maid, where you can make your home a healthy haven. So um, that wraps up another Vickers Crossing podcast for today. Thanks again to Ingrid for dropping by. My name is Rob Henderson. I'm Kevin George. And my name is Ian. And we will get together again next week with another great edition of the, of the show. So thanks, everybody, for being here. And Kevin, don't forget, my friend, to look both ways. Before you cross that street. I will. Thank you for listening. Our hosts are Kevin George and Rob Henderson. Our producer and composer is myself, Ian, with original artwork done by Elizabeth Dodman. If you have any questions or want to know where to find us, tweet us at Vickers Crossing or find us on Facebook at The Vickers Crossing. If you have any other questions about anything heard on this podcast, leave us a comment or look in the description to find out more. Thanks!